Today we build on the unethicality and morality lectures from the last two weeks to look at uh, slightly more complicated topics that are almost philosophical in nature, abstract, the very high level uh, things. So we try and push the boundaries of social psychology to see what else can social psychology tell us? So we've explored things like human nature, we've explored things like morality and ethicality. Uh, how far can we go with this? So today I want to introduce you to a new approach. It's kind of, I think it's an exciting direction. It's been going on for about, let's say about 10 years, something that I joined uh, when I did my PhD, so I decided that my thesis is going to be on things related to this uh, new exciting direction called experimental philosophy. So using social psychology, judgment, decision making, research and the methods in order to investigate things that are at the heart, at the core of philosophical debates going on for a very, very long time. So today we're going to go back in history as far as 2,500 years ago to look at things like free will, determinism, and how they are linked to uh, things like morality, uh, society, uh, law. Uh, so you'll serve as the jury and the judges in a real case that took place in 2011. And you'll contemplate how this is related to the stuff that we learn in social psychology and this new movement of experimental philosophy. So to get you started on this, uh, we're gonna start with um, like a, a scenario. So you'll get a taste of what experimental philosophy feels like. So let's have a look. Once again, we go on the Menti and we have uh, the following scenario. All right, yeah. So this is a little bit long. So bear with me, and the uh, writing is a little bit small, so I'm going to uh, read this together with you and explain what this is about. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to rate uh, four different versions, versions A, version B, version C, uh, C and D, and they all relate to the same scenario. So what is this uh, strange scenario that we're contemplating here? And this really extends the boundaries of social psychology, judgment, decision-making to new real realms. Jim is an accountant living in Chicago. One day, he sustains a severe head injury from a car accident. His only chance for survival is participation in an advanced medical experiment called the Type 2 Transplant Procedure. What is this procedure? It is the year 2049, so we're looking at sci-fi into the future. Scientists are able to grow different parts of the brain if those become damaged. A stock of brain tissue is kept um, and then used spare parts in case of an emergency. So let's assume that we are going to do a brain operation on uh, Jim by replacing some of his uh, brain tissue. Um, and then just to make sure that Jim is really uh, still Jim, the doctors test all kinds of uh, physiological responses to determine if the patient is alive and functioning they also scan the brain to see uh, whether you know the transplant was successful and they run some psychological tests. Now, the question is for each one of these impairments, let's say that something happened to Jim. If after the surgery, they do the tests and they found out one of these four problems, the question is, is the transplant recipient, is it still Jim or has Jim changed? So for example, in version A, they discovered that the transplant recipient has lost his ability to recognize objects. He can see perfectly fine, but his ability to identify objects has disappeared. So he can't make sense of the objects that he sees in his vision. So that's version A. So the question to you, uh, to what extent do you agree that if somebody has this problem because of this brain transplant, that this is still Jim? Is it Jim? And the second one, version B, apathy. They discover that the transplant recipient has lost all his desires. Uh, he's no longer uh, able to want or desire anything. Aside from this, he thinks and acts the same way that he always has before the accident. So this is apathy. 
The third one is about morality. So this is kind of the link to the previous two weeks. They discover the transplant recipient has lost his moral compass. He is no longer capable of judging right from wrong or being moved by the suffering of others. Aside from that, he thinks and acts the same way that he uh, uh, did before. So is it still Jim or not Jim? Version uh, D, the religion, they discover that the transplant recipient has lost his faith in God. He longer, no longer goes to church and no longer commits to religious activities. So assuming that Jim had some kind of faith, uh, now after this brain transplant, he has lost his faith and he doesn't uh, attend any more religious activities. Is it still Jim or has Jim uh, changed? Is this transplant recipient with a different brain tissue Perhaps there's something that's not Jim. So I'll let you kind of contemplate what this means and try to rank for each one of those uh, versions uh, to what extent uh, this is Jim or not. While you do this, I'll let you know that this is part of um, what I consider to be a classic experiment. This is done by uh, these two, uh, so Nina and Sean over here. And uh, you can see this was published in Cognition. So Cognition is definitely a psychology journal about well, cognitive psychology. And it's called The Essential Moral Self. And what's interesting is that uh, I think Nina is more of perhaps a psychologist, but uh, Sean over here is definitely an experimental uh, philosopher. Uh, he's a philosopher in his uh, upbringing. And they together try to understand what do we consider to be the most essential component of the self? What is it that if we moved, we no longer see the person to be the same person? So I think that this experiment, so we're talking about contemplating a very, very strange uh, scenario of something that might happen in the future, 2049, when they can do these uh, brain transplants. I think it's a very clever way of looking of uh, how central is morality to the self. So uh, what they show over here, um, this is the abstract from, from the article. It has often been suggested that the mind is central to a personal uh, identity, but do all parts of the mind contribute equally? So we've seen uh, these uh, four parts over here compared to the control. So I put in the figures over here. And what you can see, this is the degree of identity change. So disagreeing that this is uh, still Jim. And as you can see, every uh, one of these components over here, morality, amnesia, and apathy are higher than the control with the dominant one being the center of, of the whole thing, the most essential component being morality. So previous week we, we saw, we debated morality, but we never really approached the, the question of how, how important is morality? Why is, why is morality important? Now we understand using this um, very interesting paradigm, just by asking a simple scenario of people, presenting them with different the different uh, options of what might has might have been impaired, we can get a sense of which one of those is the most essential. Now, the thing is, is that in their original design, each one of those was a different group. So this is condition one, and this is between subjects. So then this is condition two, different participants, condition three, different participants. So uh, they had five different conditions. And uh, it turns out the people who saw the morality version are the ones who um, rated their identity change to be, to be the highest. So they say across five experiments, we demonstrate that moral traits more than any other mental uh, faculty are considered to be the most essential part of their identity, the self, and perhaps if you consider soul. So things that we thought might be central, for example, memory, or things like uh, emotions, autobiographical memory are also important. So we can see over here, amnesia is important. It's not, it's not uh, exactly like the control, but it's still less than, than morality. So it seems like even beyond memories, morality has something fundamental about it that we really care about that identifies who we are and we, we um, link this with, with the self. 
So if we look at uh, this over here, we have uh, three of you that uh, rated this very long scenario. So what did you say uh, about this? So um, definitely uh, successful replication in terms of morality. So if we look at this completely disagree over here on the left, so uh, the lower you are, the less you agree with Jim being still Jim. So it means that identity change is higher when the score here is lower. So definitely morality over here is, is, uh, is the highest uh, change. Uh, so it seems like even in our sample, uh, morality seems to be something that's very fundamental to the self. Also, you can say apathy, agnosia um, are, are sli slightly behind over this. And then religion, if you recall, was not in the original one over here. Uh, a guided thesis student did this with me, Samsung, and he added extensions, just like you're adding extensions to your own replication. And he wanted to see uh, so what could be competing with morality? Uh, what could be as important to people? And we thought, given that this is, we ran this in, uh, in the US using Amazon Mechanical Turk online. So uh, Samsung thought maybe, maybe religion, but we can see at least for our uh, very small Hong Kong sample with the five students at HPU, religion not, not that important. Uh, people, people lose their faith, but we'll see in a second what Samsung found uh, with our replication. So very interesting that this uh, morality, this is a within design. So you all saw all the conditions, but we, I didn't hide any conditions from you. So it seems like it uh, doesn't matter much whether this is a between design or uh, within design. It seems like there is some agreement that morality seems to be a very important component. Now it might be interesting to hear from me or not, but I think much more interesting to hear this from the original authors. So uh, Nina and Sean over here would like to uh, talk a little bit about their paper. So I'll let you hear this from, from them. Hi, I'm Nina Strominger. I work at Yale University in the School of Management and the Department of Cognitive Science. And I'm Sean Nichols. I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Arizona. Imagine it's the not distant future and you're in a car crash. Part of your brain is damaged in the crash and the doctors have to replace it with a microchip, but the microchip is faulty and it doesn't completely restore every part of your mind. One way it could malfunction is it could lead you to no longer be able to identify objects. This is called visual object agnosia. Another malfunction the microchip is capable of producing is it removes all of your desires and interests, music you like, your hobbies, your goals for the future. The microchip can also lead to amnesia for all your experiences prior to the crash. Finally, the microchip could lead you to lose your moral compass, your ability to know the difference between right and wrong. For which of these injuries to your mind would your identity be the most altered? Philosophy has provided multiple conjectures about the answer to this kind of question. Some philosophers, like Bernard Williams, have suggested that biological continuity, having the same organism, is the most important part of identity. On this view, the aspect of the scenario that would alter your identity the most is the addition of the microchip to your brain, because that's changing the organismic properties. So it's not the changes to the psychological function that matter primarily in this case, it's the changes to the biology that matter. An alternative account is the collection of psychological traits, like personality traits and preferences, that that's the basis for identity. In particular, the mental features that most allow us to differentiate one person from another seem that they'd be likely candidates for being a critical part of personal identity. If that view is correct, then losing one's distinctive desires and memories should cause the greatest change to identity. Memory has traditionally been seen as playing an especially crucial role in personal identity. John Locke illustrates this idea with a thought experiment about a prince and a cobbler. Imagine that the mind of a prince containing all the prince's past experiences were to enter into and replace the cobbler's memories and experiences. This new individual, is he the prince or the cobbler? Locke thinks the answer is really obvious. Of course, this is the prince. It's just that now the prince is inhabiting the body of the cobbler. More recently, it's been suggested that morality is the most important part of identity. Cultural folklore provides indirect evidence in favor of this idea. For instance, in Western religious traditions, souls are seen 
not only is an entity that lends us our unique identity, but is the source of our conscience and moral action. However, the view that morality is key to identity has not traditionally been given much attention in philosophical circles. Despite the central position this question has occupied in philosophical debates, it's only been recently that philosophers have begun collecting data to show how people actually conceive of personal identity. Locke believed that memories were the most important part of identity, but does this map on to the way people actually think about identity? To find out, Sean and I ran a study where we presented subjects with the microchip thought experiment. People in this study overwhelmingly report that loss of the moral faculty leads to the greatest change in someone's identity. The elimination of memories and desires also leads to a substantial change in identity subjects report, just not as dramatic as one produced by a loss of moral capacities. Basic psychological processes, like object recognition, are not particularly important to identity permanence. And mere physical changes, such as installing the microchip that perfectly preserves mental function, leads to the lowest degree of perceived identity change. When people consider what makes someone who they are, they place central importance on moral capacity. And this runs counter to perhaps the best-known theory of personal identity, Locke's memory criterion, according to which you're the same person just in case you remember having the experience of some past person. In other studies, we found what people regard as most important about identity isn't really distinctiveness. It's the moral traits. And the moral traits that people have can be commonplace and yet more critical to identity than traits that are more distinctive. So, for instance, many people are nice, but losing that common trait is regarded as a much more dramatic insult to one's identity than losing some highly unusual preference, like a penchant for, I, I don't know, watermelon infused with beef juice. This study also illustrates the power of empirical data to shed light on age-old philosophical problems. While data can provide a definitive answer to the metaphysical question of what ought identity to be, it can tell us how we think about our identities in everyday life. So that gives you a taste of experimental philosophy, and that's exciting stuff. So we can look at stuff from Locke in the 17th century, looking at, uh, you know, he had some hypothesis he wanted to uh, know. He thought maybe memories, um, you know, all sorts of other parts are essential to the self. But now with this very simplified social psychological way of tapping into, uh, you know, lay person's mindsets, we can get a kind of a sense of uh, what people think about this very old philosophical question of what's the most essential component to the self. So I like this kind of stuff. Uh, very exciting. I think that this uh, really demonstrated this very well. And it's, it's, a, it's a very clever, simple experiment with a very high impact and very interesting insights. So if you thought before, no, these philosophical debates uh, can't really look into them, not that interesting, not that relevant. What can we do? How can we study this? Now, social psychology has an answer for you. And Nina and Sean over here did a remarkable demonstration of this. So I like this study so much that I was looking for somebody to uh, help me replicate this. I'm very grateful for Samsung uh, to uh, kind of tackle this together with me. And you can see over here, it's very similar to this uh, table uh, figure that uh, Nina and Sean did. Uh, this, is, this is Samsung, and you can see he has more than five. He has seven different... Uh, things and this is from the replication. This is real data. And what you can see is that once again, just like our um, sample over here at HKU, just like uh, Nina and Sean's, uh, morality seems to be uh, the highest, followed by amnesia and apathy, uh, all higher than than control. Now he added two. Uh, he added religion and ideology. Uh, we thought maybe ideology or religion will be as high as morality. But uh, no, uh, we can't beat morality. Uh, even in the religious uh, ideological United States, we've seen all sorts of implications for religion and ideology in the recent uh, elections, uh, but still nothing, nothing goes over morality. So Samson's um, the summary that he wrote is that uh, the results in parts uh, one and two showed medium to strong support for the extension hypothesis that we'll talk about. Um, in terms of ideology and religion, but the utmost significance of moral self still remains unchallenged. So uh, we, can't, we can't beat the morality over here. 
uh, sometimes in replications things don't work out but with this replication uh, extremely well well done in terms of very successful replication we found strong support for the superiority of morality uh, we also find strong support for the utmost significance of moral traits and we also found support for the differences between two pairs uh, regarding morality and, and all that so you can see another diagram also morality here religion is a little bit closer to that but still morality is is the highest and what you can see if you remember from your assessment tasks about how to assess whether a replication is uh, consistent or not consistent, the same results or not the same results as the original. Here, uh, we had very consistent effects, even in the ones that were inconsistent. Just look at these Cohen Ds, um, very, very, very strong effects, 1.3, 0 0.88. If you recall a Cohen D of eight or 0 0.7, 0 0.8 is considered to be strong. So these are very, very strong effects, very, very consistent. And if you compare the original to the replication, we were able to achieve very, very similar results. You know, 1.31, 1.24, um, re remarkable how well this replication uh, uh, was um, completed. So we saw a very successful re replication, uh, very interesting findings. Um, but I want to show you one more step. One of the, I think, founders of experimental philosophy is Joshua Nob over here. And he took this uh, to look at uh, what's called the true self. So what is it in you that you would consider to be the true self? And let's say that you have two conflicting directions. One pulls you this way, the other pulls you in another way. How do you know which one of them is the true self? And Joshua over here really combines experimental philosophy using a social psychology paradigm by also looking and demonstrating a judgment and decision making uh, bias. So let's hear it from Joshua Nob about his true self research. Hi, I'm Josh Nob. I'm a professor at Yale University, and I'm going to be talking about the notion of a true self. So let's begin with a classic case of a conflict between belief and emotion. Imagine a man named Mark who has a belief that homosexuality is a sin. So he thinks that it's morally wrong for people to be with others of the same sex. And in fact, he travels the world preaching this message and teaching people techniques they can use to resist same-sex attraction. But now imagine that Mark has a problem. Mark's problem is that he himself is actually gay. So on a kind of emotional, visceral level, he's drawn to be with other men. As a result, Mark is feeling a conflict between his beliefs and his emotions. And the question I want to ask now is, which of those two aspects of him is his true self? Which is the part that really reveals who he himself most truly is deep down inside? So here, different people might have different views. Some people might say, ultimately, your true self is constituted by your beliefs, by your reasoning, by your abstract thinking. So they might say, Mark's true self is a part of him that says that homosexuality is a sin. But then other people might have exactly the opposite view. They might say, your true self is constituted by your emotions, by your visceral desires, by your passions. And then they might say, Mark's true self is the part of him that's drawn toward being with another man. So I was talking about this question with two of my colleagues, George Newman and Paul Bloom. And we began thinking, maybe people's ordinary notion of the true self doesn't really fit with either of these two conceptions. Instead, maybe people's ordinary notion of the true self is shaped in a really fundamental way by their value judgments. So maybe when people are thinking about your true self, what they do is to think about which aspect of yourself is the valuable one, the good one, the one worth preserving. So to see whether this is right, we conducted an experimental study. One group of participants was just given the exact case of Mark that I just gave to you. But then we wanted to know whether people's value judgments affected people's answers to this question. So we recruited two different groups of participants, liberal participants and conservative participants. And what we found was a striking difference. So the conservative participants tended to say that Mark's belief was part of his true self, that his belief that homosexuality was morally wrong 
was in some sense the voice of his true self speaking to him. The liberals tended to say exactly the opposite. They said that that belief was not part of his true self, and that his true self was actually constituted by his emotions, or his desires, or his passions, the part of him that was drawing him to be with another man. So looking just at that first result, you get at least some evidence that people's judgments about the true self are in some way shaped by their value judgments. But to see whether this is really true, we recruited a separate group of participants who received the reverse of that first case. So these group of participants were told about a person who believes that people of all sexual orientations should be treated equally. So he thinks that it's morally wrong to in any way discriminate against gay people. And in fact, he travels the world preaching this message and teaching people techniques they can use to resist their prejudice against homosexuals. However, this person has a problem. His problem is that he himself has these negative emotions toward gay people. So he himself finds himself feeling disgust toward homosexuals. And as a result, he also is faced with an inner conflict, a conflict between his beliefs and his emotions. Here too, we find a difference, but this time it's in the opposite direction as it were. So the liberal participants tend to say his belief that people of all sexual orientations should be treated equally, that is the voice of his true self speaking to him. By contrast, the conservative participants say that belief isn't his true self at all. His true self is revealed by this emotion he has, this disgust toward gay people. So looking now at the whole pattern of results, what we see is, it's not that people always think that your beliefs are your true self, and it's not that people always think that your emotion is your true self. Rather, what seems to happen is that people pick out whichever part of you they regard as the good part, the valuable part, the part worth preserving. They think that that is your true self. But now, these experimental results leave us with a question at a more philosophical level. The question is, should we think of this fact about people's judgments as just showing a bias, or a distortion, a mistake they're making? Or should we think that it's actually revealing something fundamental about the very concept of a true self? So what do you think? Do you think it reveals something about the way that we look at the true self? Uh, at the very least, there is seems to be some demonstration of, of a bias here, a self-serving bias in the sense that we just pick the part that is aligned with the way that we want to think about the person. It, it just depends on our on our ideology. But then uh, Josh over here is is suggesting that perhaps this is revealing something something else. So if you're curious about this sort of thing, if this is something that's of interest to you, if you like these kinds of uh, games, looking into what people think about the true self, how people define the true self, how people react when you ask them about the true self, then I think maybe social psychology slash experimental philosophy is for you. And a lot of the papers that Joshua and Ob, uh, comes out with uh, are fascinating. Like every one of those really keeps you thinking about uh, so what does this mean about us uh, where is this going what's going to be the next step so if you want you can go in and have a look at this uh at this paper it's very simplified methodology you can see the way that they ask people to rate so they actually had this diagram showing the true self like uh, the yellow part within the general self of where we are and then just asking people which one do you think is the most representative just look at all these diagrams and rank which one seems to be uh, uh, the, the most um, in line with, with your thought about this. Um, so you can see over here that observers are more likely to see a person's true self reflected in the behavior that they deem to be morally good than in the behaviors that they deem to be uh, bad. So you can see, once again, we saw morality as uh, the essential self in the previous one. Once again, it, we can't escape morality so the way that we make judgments about true self, the way that we evaluate others also has to do with what we consider to be morally good or morally bad. And then in the second one, observers own moral values influence what they judge to be another person's true self. So it comes into play about self-evaluations when we think about our, our own capacities, but definitely when we evaluate what others uh, essential self true self uh, is just a word about the, uh, this this team over here so joshua Nobe, i told you already uh, perhaps one of the founders leaders of this experimental philosophy group paul bloom is a, a very well known 
psychologist. He does stuff with uh, developmental psychology, educational. So he has uh, the, the thing with moral babies, showing that babies, even before speech, you can uh, look at the way that they interpret uh, morality. Uh, some very interesting findings over there. I think some of them are now being uh, under, uh, you know, a very big project of many babies that's trying to replicate stuff with developmental psychology. So I'm not up to date with uh, how well they did on moral babies, but at least when you look at the videos on YouTube and you read the Paul Bloom's books, uh, fascinating things about morality, showing uh, where it's coming from, how far uh, does it go into our childhood, and he does some of these experiments with uh, six months old uh, babies. So that, that's remarkable. Uh, Got to hand it uh, to him. And then he occasionally uh, talks on podcasts. He had uh, TED Talks as well. In podcasts, he talks with uh, Sam Harris, who is a very well-known uh, podcaster. And occasionally, we mentioned in previous weeks, the very bad wizards. So sometimes Paul Bloom uh, comes in and jokes around uh, with the two wizards. Um, and then talks about things regarding philosophy and psychology. So uh, great team, fascinating study, terrific, terrific stuff. Now, we've seen some stuff about morality and we've seen some stuff about the moral, uh, essential self, true self. The question is, how far can we go with this? What else can we, can we do here? So I wanna show you some examples from my own research. Uh, which is very much experimental philosophy. And I've played around with this um, many times in many different uh, aspects. And I want to share some of that with you to show you that in social psychology and experimental philosophy, we can even contemplate our uh, general existence, the entire universe. Uh, let's, let's see what that looks like. So we'll go back. To our uh, mentee. And now we're going to contemplate uh, a universe. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, the universe, the description, and then I want you to rank it on different, uh, different uh, measures over here. For example, realism. Do you think that this uh, universe is similar to ours or not? And then morality. Do you think that people can be held morally responsible and so forth? So first, this universe. So think about this universe. In this universe, this is universe A. Almost everything that happens is completely caused by whatever happened before it. The one exception, there is an exception to this rule, is human decision making. So we humans do not follow this rule. For example, one day John decided to have French fries at lunch. Since a person in this universe is not completely caused by what happened before it, even if everything in the universe was exactly the same up until John made his decision, it did not have to happen that John would decide to have French fries. John could have decided to have something completely different. So the rules of the universe with the determinism uh, do not affect humans. Therefore, John really has the capacity to overrule and choose whatever it is that he wants to choose. So the questions are, um, is this realistic? Is this similar to how you experience our own universe? Then in this kind of universe, whatever you think, however realistic you think this is, do you think that in this kind of universe, people can be held morally responsible for their own actions? And then let's say that you live in this kind of universe. How happy do you think you would be living in this, in this universe? And then in terms of uh, pro-sociality, do you think that people living in this universe would be pro-social, not pro-social? What's your take on this? So I'll give you a bit of time to think about this. It's, a, it's an interesting scenario, and I think it's one that you're not used to answering when you do uh, psychology experiments, because it really looks at something very fundamental about the way that we perceive the universe. Uh, if we imagine this kind of universe, the way that we perceive what might happen in this uh, possibly fictional, fictional universe. So now that you've had a chance to contemplate universe A, I want to introduce you to, um, you know it, universe B. So what's happening with this universe B? Let's think about this universe B. Imagine a universe, universe B, 
in which everything that had happened is completely caused by everything that happened before it. This is true from the very beginning of the universe. So what happened in the beginning of the universe caused what happened next and so on right until this present. So let's say that you had this supercomputer at the beginning of the universe and it can, uh, you know, has all the rules of the universe. We know everything about physics, what's, what's going to happen, you know, until the end of time, what's going to take place. So for example, one day John decided to have French fries at lunch, like everything else. This decision was completely caused by what happened before it. So uh, if everything in this universe was exactly the same up until John made his decision, that it had to happen. There was no other way for John to decide uh, to have anything to have French fries. So um, it, it, you know, there's only one, one path that follows from uh, what happened from the beginning of, of, of the universe. So John has absolutely no control, no freedom to choose what it is uh, that, that he wants to do. Therefore, he had to have French fries. So once again, my question to you is, is this similar to our own universe? To what extent is this similar? Um, zero to, uh, to one, 100. And then uh, do you think that in this kind of universe, people can be held morally responsible? Is, is more moral responsibility possible? In this sort of thing. And then finally, let's say that you live in this kind of universe. How happy would you be in this kind of universe? And then let's say that you imagine a group of people in this universe. How pro social do you think people in this universe uh, would be? So we have these uh, two, two scenarios, uh, two different kinds of universes. So you can already see perhaps where I'm going with this, right? So uh, universe B is definitely uh, more deterministic. Uh, it follows the uh, determinism. So you can follow the rules of, of, of nature from the beginning of time till the end of time. Everything is predetermined and there's no room for choice. In universe A, there is a capacity for humans to be different. The humans are able to uh, deviate from that. Uh, some people might say because of a soul, some people might say because of other things, but looking at humans as something that is different from whatever else is happening in the universe. So I'm curious, are you curious to see what you said about this? So in terms of realism, um, 75 is pretty high on realism. So you found this to be quite, quite realistic. And then you, you found this to also be uh, morally responsible and then uh, that you would be very happy to live in this kind of universe. And then generally you feel like people would be uh, pro-social here. They, we all, like we had maybe one of you that kind of was uh, maybe towards the negative side, but overall we see a lot of you uh, over here on this uh, right side. So this indeterministic, that was, that's what the I is here, this indeterministic uh, universe is, seems uh, somewhat similar to what it is that you think is happening in our own universe. Now, how do you feel about the deterministic uh, universe? If we look at the uh, results, this seems much less like, um, like what we experience in, in, in our reality. So you thought that the indeterministic one is more realistic than the deterministic one. So it seems like you have some notion that uh, humans are uh, different in the sense that we can override or we can deviate or we can have some capacity for choice despite the determinism of the universe. But I think what's interesting is that you also make the connection between uh, you know, this uh, the level of determinism uh, with moral responsibility. So compared to the previous one, level of moral responsibility was high. But if we look at the level of moral responsibility in this deterministic universe, it's much lower. In terms of happiness, many of you think you would not be happy in this deterministic universe. And then uh, in terms of pro-sociality, you feel like uh, people would not be pro-social. Like typically if we would be sitting in a classroom, I would ask you a lot of questions about this because it makes me really curious. So I've been studying this you know, for a very long time, since 2012, 13, looking at issues of free will, determinism, and how this is uh, related to people. And, and I think people are very uh, passionate about this. I think they really care about their notions of, of free will, uh, having free will, deciding 
free will. So a bit like with morality, free will seems to be something that's essential, or at the very least uh, linked to morality, linked to happiness, linked to prosociality. So that, that's an interesting take from a very simple experiment. Usually, once again, I give this in a between design. So one group sees the indeterministic, indeterministic and the other group sees the deterministic universe, and then they rate this, and then we uh, do an analysis. Over here, we've, we've shown this in a, in a within study design uh, where you contemplated both of these uh, universes. So we have these two universes over here compared uh, one, one to, to the other. Um, and and the, thing, the thing about this is that um, like you, might, you might ask yourself, okay, so we contemplated a universe and you've shown perhaps with a very small sample, and this is consistent generally with the stuff that I find in my own experiments. So you've shown some link between uh, free will slash determinism to uh, moral responsibility and uh, happiness, pro-sociality. But why do we care? Why, why, why is this important? Why do you want to know what we think about free will? How is this related to practical things in, in real life? So I want to share a little bit with you to show you case studies of where free will really comes into play with practical things. So I want us together to try and be a jury or a judge in a real case that took, that took place in 2011. And the case goes like this. It's a little bit long, so bear with me, but it's very important as the jury, as the judge, that you're familiar with all the details. So it's uh, a, a, such an extreme story, but a very real one from the, from the US that sometimes you got to wonder, it's like uh, reality sometimes really goes beyond any Hollywood script. So just listen to this very, very interesting uh, case study. So in 2011, 2 a.m., uh, there was this patrol officer, uh, Melvin Smith, who stopped a Honda after it pulled out of a nightclub lot, a parking lot with darkened highlights. So there was a problem with the, with, it didn't have the lights on so uh, it was pulled over. Now, inside the car, when the officer looked inside the car, it smelled like alcohol. And of course, driving while under the influence of alcohol is, is, uh, is forbidden. Now, Barnes, who is the driver, started slurring. So he used profanity and his eyes were glassy. And then while he was trying to balance, you know, so they give them uh, the alcohol test to see whether uh, you know, they're sober or not. Uh, he assumed a karate kid pose. <laughs> so he started doing some Kung Fu stuff. And then the officer uh, decided to bring him in to uh, jail, to a detention center, where he announced that he had to pee. So after he did the karate kid and he was brought into the detention center, he says, I want to go to the toilet. <laughs> so, <laughs> already some interesting stuff over here. Now, the reason why some people, when they get into the detention center, they say that we want to go to the toilet is not because they want to really pee, <clears throat> but sometimes they have drugs on them and they want to dump those. So the officer takes him to the bathroom and then he adjusts the handcuffs so he can use the urinal. And then he steps back to watch him uh, use the urinal <laughs> and just pee. So because uh, maybe, like we don't know, but maybe because he was intoxicated or maybe he was trying to dispose of the drugs or maybe he was just shy, uh, Barnes started urinating on himself, soaking his pants. Upset, he blamed Smith, the, offic the officer, for the misshape. Now, they started to get a little bit aggressive with each other and finally Smith called for assistance. And when the officers finally got control over Barnes, then suddenly drugs came out. So four grams of drug fell out of his pants leg. Now, here comes the issue. And this is where you as a jury or a judge need to decide on the fate. Now, the thing is, if he would be caught with drugs only five minutes earlier, so if he would be caught with drugs outside of the detention center, he would get 15 days. But because the officers discovered the drugs only after they took him to jail, under the suspicion of driving while impaired, Barnes was facing the possibility of a felony enhancement. 
and he was facing a felony of eight months in jail because they found drugs in a local confinement facility. So bringing drugs into jail is a much more serious offense. But the thing is, was he in control? Did he have a choice of going to the uh, local confinement facility? Did he bring the drugs intentionally in? Uh, or perhaps he was you know, drunk, perhaps he, he, he under the influence of drugs. Obviously he was handcuffed by, by the police officers, so he couldn't have not brought the drugs into the jail. What do you think as the jury that Barnes should be charged with? Should he be charged with 15 days for only drug possession, which he would have gotten if he would be found with drugs outside of the jail? Or because this was found in the jail, do you think that he should be charged with eight months of possession of controlled sub substance in a local confinement facility? So, you know, really reality uh, beyond any, any fiction, really fascinating stuff. And I want to show you like the headline. The headline was, uh, I found this in a newspaper in 2014. So we, we saw this, this was in 2011. It took three years, three years for this to reach the Supreme Court of North Carolina. And what they, they, they said, the, the North Carolina Supreme Court, here's a case about drugs, urine, and free will. You gotta love this kind of, this kind of headline. So this is kind of like a summary of the whole, the whole case. Um, so taken to jail by police for drunk driving, while in jail found he had concealed drugs. He was charged with drugs in prison eight months, which is much harsher than the drugs possession 15 uh, days. Is he guilty? What is he guilty of? Um, so I want to read to you before I look at what it is that you said, I want to read to you the from, this is a copy paste, a screenshot from the actual uh, report over here. So nevertheless, the jury found Barnes guilty. Last fall in a 2-1 split decision, the state court of appeals, so he appealed this guilty charge, the state court of appeals upheld the trial's court verdict because Barnes knew he was in a possession of weed inside the jail. He was responsible for it, the judges ruled. They argued that he should have handed over the concealed drugs prior to his arrival to the jail and that ignorance is no excuse. So these judges and obviously the, the jury that heard this case said, no, he was in control. He should have known better. He should have said something about the drugs. But the question is, could he have done this? Could he have reported? Could he have said something? So because this was a two by one split, the question is, what did this one person who disagreed with this decision say? And here we have Judge Linda McGee. Uh, and what she said was that because Barnes was brought into jail involuntarily, he was not guilty of the enhanced charge. Barnes, she wrote, had no ability to choose his own course of action regarding his location. It's not his fault that this was found out in jail. Uh, so he had no choice but to follow the officers. He was handcuffed and he was also drunk, possibly under the influence of also drugs. So was he really able to process his knowledge to know what was going on? So already here, if we try to summarize this very interesting case, we see uh, the words involuntarily, not guilty, associated. This, she, she, this judge is making the connection between these two, finally uh, making uh, uh, some kind of claim about free will, not, uh, no ability, not being able to choose his own course of action. And because of that, she thinks he should not feel, uh, not be guilty. So a lot of interesting things going on uh, over here. Now, if you think about this, what, what is this connection between free will and moral responsibility and, and the law? So if you see over here, this mass murderer, this person over here shot 12 people and injured 70 in a packed Denver area movie theater in July, 2012. Now, the thing is, is that once he was, was caught, after he killed all these uh, innocent people, injured 70, uh, killed 12, he went into court and says, I shouldn't be guilty because I plead insanity. So what is this? 
what is this insanity? Why can somebody plead insanity and avoid the guilty charge? And he was saying, it was not my decision. It was not under my control. Uh, God made me do it. Uh, you know, a demon made me do it. Something made me do it. I did not choose. Somebody else chose. Uh, it does seem like uh, some uh, people, perhaps even people who are not insane, uh, plead this this sort of thing. So it's kind of a way of, of uh, trying to get reduced charge or not even getting any charge at all. How many? You can see that this is actually quite quite common. Uh, the insanity plead is is uh, is very common. And uh, you know, if you follow any of the uh, law series in in the U.S., uh, quite a lot. And the question is, how do we know whether he is insane or not? Who gets to say? How do we really know whether this person who did all these horrific things is insane or not insane? And then we need to understand that our assessment of whether this person is sane or not sane seems to have an influence under our law, the system of law, of whether this person will get to go to jail. Now, if we try to summarize the whole thing, there is an assumption that free will exists. So uh, people are able to choose their actions. And then it seems to be some kind of prerequisite for moral accountability. So to be able to hold people accountable for their own actions, it seems to be important for the law system in, in the US and in many places around the world to look at, at the issues of, of free will. So what is free will? The ability to choose own actions. But if we look at this very interesting case, we had both constraints in terms of internal concerns. So he was drunk. In this case, for example, he says he was insane. But sometimes we have external constraints. So for example, the cops put him in handcuffs and brought him to, to the detention center. Did he really have any choice not to bring it in? Um, it was just brought together with him. But the most important thing is that uh, there's this kind of assumption in the American law system and in many places uh, around the world is that if someone cheated or did something wrong, it must have been out of their own free will because if not, we can't hold them accountable. So that's an interesting case. Now I'm curious to, to see what you what you said about this. Like, what's your verdict? <laughs> your verdict is 15 days for, for drug possession. So if you were the jury, you would uh, give him only 15 days. Uh, possibly you didn't you didn't comment on this. I would ask you in class why you would do this, but now I'm just assuming that this has something to do with him not being able to uh, to choose whether to bring this into jail or not. But as you can see, you're in the minority because actually, uh, at least with this kind of uh, case, what we saw is that both the jury and the majority of the appeal court. Uh, found him to be guilty of the eight eight months, um, and then it came to the Supreme Court. I should look it up and see how how the Supreme Court decided on this. But I think really a fascinating case. The most important thing that I want to say is that now we understand that we need to look into how people think about free will. The way that people think about free will and this link to moral accountability is very important, especially in the US where it's based on a jury. Jury are not judges. They don't know the law very well. They get jury duty. They come into court. It's lay persons, just like you know, a person from the street, like you and I, our families. And then they need to decide on somebody's fate. Uh, does he get 15 days or, or eight months? Uh, and, and sometimes it's like whether a person gets life or walks free. So big decisions all based on perceptions of free will. So if you think, oh, this experimental philosophy stuff, it's not that interesting, we can't gain a lot from it. Now I'm showing you that there are real implications for these notions of, of free will, these philosophical debates about determinism versus free will and what happens in these, in these kinds of, of realities, these kinds of universes, when we look at these kinds of, of topics. So to... Um, give like a summary <clears throat> of this link between uh, free will and morality, we can go back to Friedrich Nietzsche uh, back <laughs> many, many years ago, uh, who was a bit cynical about uh, free will, uh, definitely did not like the concept very much. And he 
thought that the reason why free will was sort of invented or promoted in society, uh, the only reason is that so we can judge and punish people because if we you know, want people to, to feel like uh, they should behave better, then we can just give them the, the, this illusion of, of being, being free. So very interesting perspective from uh, Friedrich over here. And we can see that uh, dating uh, back to, we saw John Locke, uh, 17th century. Uh, we see more, more modern philosophers, but definitely things that have been debated for a while have to do with uh, fascinating philosophical uh, debates. Back in 2012, 2013, I exchanged to Florida State University to work with uh, Roy Baumeister, where we discussed all sorts of topics about free will. And the nice thing is that in Florida State University, uh, Alfred was there, and we're gonna hear from him in a second. And he got this really interesting grant from the Templeton Foundation to study free will. So he teamed up, he is a philosopher, he teamed up with Roy Baumeister, with other experimental philosophers, with other social psychologists, cognitive psychologists, um, neuroscientists, and across the disciplines, bringing them into one conference, one room, and doing publications together to try and decide together as a modern contemporary group of scientists, how do we regard free will? What is free will and what is this link to moral responsibility. So I'll, I'll give you a hint, just a little bit of a few long episodes where uh, many of these people are being interviewed. So this is a, a short summary from Alfred. How to understand free will and moral responsibility. How do they intersect? What are the links, conceptual, causal? I go to Florida State University to ask an expert on action theory, Professor Alfred Miele. Al is the leader of the Big Questions in Free Will Project, a collaboration of scientists and philosophers that seeks fresh approaches to old questions. Al, what's the relationship between understanding free will and appreciating our moral responsibility as individuals or indeed society's uh, approach to crime and punishment. The dominant view in philosophy is that free will is a necessary condition for moral responsibility so that a person who has no free will is not morally responsible for anything. That's a standard view. We hear that in the courts, uh, the claim of insanity and crime is a, is a way to be innocent of a crime. Yeah, so you could think of a free will defense that's an analog of the insanity defense. So the claim would be, well, if you didn't have free will at the time or you didn't do it freely, um, then you're not morally responsible for it. There are ways to try to separate the two, pull them apart, free will and moral responsibility. You can think about them as different views about places to put the bars. And then you're gonna have a bar for moral responsibility too. On one view of free will, all you need to have it is to be sane, rational, no gun to your head, have good information, and make decisions on the basis of the good information you have. So that's, uh, that's a relatively low bar for free will. And you might think, well, that's a good bar for moral responsibility too. But then you might think, oh yeah, but those conditions I gave you and suggested that they were sufficient for free will are consistent with determinism. And you might think, but free will requires that determinism be false. It requires that at the very time at which you act. I really can do something different. Yeah, I can, <laughs> let's say in a deep way, really deep way, can do something different. So then you might raise the bar for free will up to there, but you might think, Ah, oh, but the bar for moral responsibility uh, doesn't have to be raised right. up to there. That can stay down here. Then you have a view according to which moral responsibility doesn't require free will. And why is that? Because you've set the bar for free will higher than the bar for moral responsibility. 
the two spectrum are are really very different things. One is the deep ontology and the metaphysics of what we're all about in our consciousness. The other is how we have to run society. Uh, yeah, there are two schools of thought about this, and that is certainly one. So let's have a lower bar for moral responsibility than for free will for pragmatic reasons. Another school of thought is no. So it goes on for a while, and you can see uh, philosophers have these kinds of, of debate. How about we do this, and then we raise, and we separate those. Uh, typically, <coughs> what he's trying to talk about over here is that free will <coughs> can be thought of as something that's uh, metaphysical in the sense that uh, we are separated, just like in the scenario that a universe allows humans to uh, divert, to change course, from the deterministic rules of, of the universe. And it seems like some of you are supportive uh, of that. But some say, even if the world is deterministic, we still have free will in the sense that even if everything flows from, follows from the uh, beginning of the universe till this very moment, still the main question is not whether there's uh, you know, our capacity for free will in the uh, metaphysical sense or our capacity to deviate from the rules of, of, of nature, but rather the very simple question of, given the current reality, did we have any coercion? Did anybody tell us, uh, put a gun to our head that we must do this? Did we have the capacity in terms of the context uh, to, to do this uh, sort of thing or the capacity in terms of our mental, uh, mental capabilities of, of choosing otherwise in the sense that we were sane um, and were able to make, make decisions? So two different notions thinking about free will in slightly different, uh, slightly different ways. Now I want to emphasize that this debate on what free will is dates back 2,500 years ago. And I, I really like uh, looking at some of these quotes. So when I was looking for these things during my, my PhD, I was just fascinating. Uh, so for example, here, these Greek philosophers, so Apicorus uh, versus Democritus, I think you recognize the name Democritus as the, the father of uh, democratic ideals. Epicorus is just like a, 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 it's a name, at least where I grew up, for somebody who does not believe in gods. So look at what Epicorus is saying over here. Whereas our own actions are autonomous, and it is to them that praise and blame naturally attach. That's very, very deep for 2,500 years ago, already making the link between free will and then moral accountability. So this is not something that we just found out about recently. This is from uh, back then. Look at Democritus over here. This to me, this quote was mind blowing. So the first principles of the universe are atoms and empty space atoms and empty space back in 5th century BC. Everything else is merely thought to exist. Now, both of them had a very similar agenda. Both of them did not like gods, and they wanted to get the Greek to move away from gods. Uh, Epicurus wanted people to take charge of their own, you know, uh, to say you're in charge of your own future. Therefore, why do you need uh, gods? It, it's what you decide to do that we should praise or blame you for. Democritus was saying it's like everything is predetermined. There's no, no room for, for gods because there's nothing but atoms and empty space. That's fascinating, you know, looking at uh, Greek literature. Uh, but 2,500 years later, <laughs> we're still debating this sort of thing. Just look at this neurobiological, neuroscientific debate. So on one side, we've got the Libet experiment in the you know, 1980s, 1970A, a volitional brain, uh, more recently, Sam Harris, a neuroscientist, came out, the blogger that I told you about, who uh, blogs with a uh, podcast, sorry, podcaster who did podcast with Paul Bloom, wrote in 2012 a, a book about free will being an, an illusion. But then we've got some neuroscientists. Um, this person specifically is, is a leader also in open science and open access. Um, publishing in our best journals, so Nature Reviews, Proceedings of the Royal Society, uh, talking about, this is, this is the headline from their, their papers, towards a scientific concept of free will, to show that free will is possible, even when you look uh, at the brain, at the very, the very specifics 
of, of science, human volition towards a neuroscience of will, of free will. If we look at psychology, uh, we have this debate. So yeah, I think you're familiar with Skinner and behaviorism, 1970s. More recently, I think we talked about him, not always very fondly, but uh, priming research, John Barge, saying that, you know, it's not you, but you're influenced by all sorts of things like the cup that you hold or uh, the unscrambling sentences and so forth. But if we, we uh, like move, move away from this not being uh, replicable, the general philosophical view is that free will is an illusion. Free will doesn't exist. There's stimuli on one side in behaviorism and there's a response. You trigger the stimuli, a response come up. Uh, this is on the one side that the free will does not exist. But then on the other side, Roy Baumeister, who I worked with, we did some uh, things together uh, and he wrote several articles and a, a book uh, about this. And if you ask him, this is an opinion article that he wrote for Slate. And the question is, do we really have free will? And his answer is, of course, here is how it evolved. So he has a whole notion about how free will is, uh, what's its purpose, how it came to be. Uh, and it's, it's linked to the, to the notion of, of self-control. Now, when I was doing my PhD, I was looking for all kinds of views about this. And, and here in Hong Kong, they asked me, so do you know about the Chinese philosophy of, of free will? And I said, I, I, really don't, I, I really don't know. Can you, can you tell me a little bit? So I love this quote from the third century BC. So not only in Greek, uh, you know, the philosopher uh, back in the, in the Western part of the world, but also here in, in Asia, in China. Listen to this, uh, the mind is the ruler of one's body and the master of one's spirit and intelligence. It forbids oneself, orders oneself, voluntarily takes away, voluntarily chooses, moves oneself and stop oneself. It's, it's poetic. It can be said that the mind works in such a way that its choice will clearly display itself because, and this is the most important, I love this quote, nothing hinders the mind from making a choice, nothing. So can't think of free will as stronger than what is said over here. Mind is the ruler. You can always make choices. So that's fascinating. Thing is, I grew up not in Asia and not in uh, Greece, but I grew up in a place that uh, kind of in between in the Middle East. And I grew up on the Jewish philosophy and I was always confused by this sentence over here. <laughs> so, all is foreseen. God can see everything, but freedom is granted. But you can you can have your own free will. So I was always confused. So if God can see everything that I do and knows everything that I'm going to do in the future, how is it that I have free free will? There's a bit of a contradiction here. But only later, much later, when I was doing my my PhD on free will, did I realize that free will can coexist with determinism. So you can see different views on the connection between determinism and free will. So some of you seemed like you're uh, libertarians in the sense that you felt like free will exists. So this universe is much closer to the universe that has free will, but maybe determinism is false because you said that it's unlike um, the, the universe that was deterministic. So maybe you're categorized over here in uh, libertarians. However, there's some people, compatibilists, and I think uh, over here, uh, Akiva, um, the Jewish philosopher, uh, sees determinism is true, but also is, is free will. There's no, no contradiction between the two. They can coexist, but then we have also notions that free will does not exist. Uh, so how incompatibilist or how determinist. Uh, so fascinating things about uh, the, the notion of these two together. Now, doesn't really matter what you feel about free will or not. Uh, what's interesting for me as a social psychologist, as an experimental philosopher, is not really who is right and who is wrong. Uh, 2,500 years we've been debating this, uh, no resolution so far. I, I think we can, at some point we'll have, hopefully some, some resolution to this. What's more interesting for me to hear from people is what they believe and how this is related to their cognition and their behavior of how they do things, how they behave morally, ethically, uh, how, how they uh, think about learning 
about performance, about achieving, about happiness, about pro, pro sociality. Uh, so, so this is the new approach, not trying to resolve the issue of free will determinism, but rather trying to learn what people think about this and how this is uh, impacting uh, their lives. And this is, has to do with, uh, this is Josh Noble over here that you've heard from uh, and a few others, so Sean Nichols, uh, who was it with, with uh, Nina before, but also uh, Eddie over here that uh, saying maybe free will exists, maybe it doesn't, but what's important is what laypersons are saying about this because it has implications for things that, uh, like law, like society. So it used to be that we thought about free will as something that's perhaps uh, metaphysical, uh, differentiation between mind and body, that we deviate perhaps from the rules of the universe because we're so special, we're, we're humans. Um, so I think it started from that, but typically when you ask people, this is from an actual uh, paper, trying to understand how people think about free will, we ask them, do you think that free will has something to do with metaphysics, with souls, with indeterminism? Zero, zero people think, zero percent think uh, that this has anything to do with metaphysics. Uh, we ask them, does it have to do with being free from internal and external constraints? So definitely a majority, 74%. But a lot of people really think about free will as the concept of choice. So your ability to make a decision or a choice is the essence of, of free will. So we can, we can look at uh, choice as being the core of people's concept of free will. Now, when this group of scholars came together at Florida State University with, with Alfred uh, to discuss, how do we conceptualize free will? Can we come to a joint definition regardless of what your definition of free will is, can we come to a joint definition that we can all agree on? And this is what they came up with. So this is Haggard over here. We saw him before as a neuroscientist who um, studies uh, free will uh, in, the, in the brain, in the mind. So uh, it's a very simple definition. It's the capacity to perform free actions. And then of course, this is a loaded uh, term. What are free actions? So free actions is the acting agent capacity to have chosen to do otherwise. So what does it mean that the person can do otherwise? First of all, that there's alternative options. There's on, not only just this one path and the ability to ch uh, freely choose among those options without any both internal or external uh, coercion. So internal could be, you know, overriding, uh, needs, desires, genes, uh, all sorts of things that are biological. And external coercion could be anything like uh, universe, uh, God, uh, spirits, angels, uh, society, parents, uh, instructor, tutors, you know, everything uh, that coerces you to do things. The question is, can, can you resist this and overcome this in order to be able to take your, your own actions? Now, these two uh, ph philosophers and social psychologists, and we talked about Roy as being a thought leader in social psychology. And this is Daniel Dennett, definitely one of the uh, most prominent uh, philosophers uh, currently uh, alive uh, and, and active, uh, that they have very different views on what free will is and also whether free will exists or not. So over here, Roy, uh, who I've worked with, uh, has a very interesting view on this. And the first time that Roy talked about this, I was a little bit confused, I must admit, because I've always thought about free will as something that enables me to do what I want, to choose what it is that, that, that's good for me, the way that I want things to be. And this is what Daniel over here is, is saying. He's saying free will is actually, it's all, only worth having if it enables the individual, you, to get what you want what she or he wants. But Roy is saying is that, you know, what we all really want, our urges, our needs, our desires, that we are animals, so we need to, you know, eat. We, we have some things that we need, we need to do in order to survive. And if it would only be our selfish needs, then we would just go around, you know, killing, uh, raping, stealing, all, all these kinds of things, just like animals. But we're not just regular animals, we're social animals. So our free will, 
it's not for us to do what we what we want as animals. Free will is our ability to override, to use our self-control, to go over what it is that our, our, you know, our real self, what we initially want as animals in order to pursue long-term goals, in order to uh, pursue morality, pursue norms, uh, coexist with other people in society, to move from just being an animal to being a social animal that is able to coexist with others and form a society. So very, very interesting uh, views on these kinds of, of issues. Now, the thing is, is that what free will is, is it a good thing or, or a bad thing? So we study a lot of things about the association between free will and actual behavior. Some of the positives that we see in the literature is that it does seem like people who believe in free will, uh, they take more responsibility for their actions. They perhaps are better at learning and, and changing. Um, that there's more motivation, there's higher performance, there's more satisfaction, more well being, more meaning in life. And, and to some extent, depending on how you look at this, less, less cheating. Now, the things that are less positive it does, it, that it does seem like free will, um, if you see free will uh, in yourself, um, you also see more free will in others. So perhaps you hold more people accountable for their actions, even if they're not to be held accountable. Uh, perhaps you experience more regret and guilt over things that perhaps you had no, no control over, but because you believe in free will, you felt that you had more control over. So an over-attribution of free will leading to us uh, being less forgiving, uh, punishing more, or perhaps looking at people who are less fortunate than us and like a homeless person and saying, get up and, and do something about it. It's up to you, it's your own free will. But the question is, is it always that everybody has free will? Um, not necessarily, but sometimes this belief in free will can sort of overtake some of our ability for compassion, for uh, forgiveness. And, and perhaps would lead us to, to punish and hold people accountable a little bit more. Now, the interesting thing about this is that we have a certain direction in the literature. And the question is, is that we want to try and understand what free will is for and what free will beliefs are associated with. So I teamed up with this group from the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. So I came in and and gave them a workshop on meta-analysis. And, and these students uh, decided that they wanted to do a meta-analysis on the outcomes of free will beliefs. So we mapped a lot of the things in the literature and we wrote a registered report, just like you're, you're doing right now, writing a registered report. And we submitted this to a journal. Uh, we haven't done the meta-analysis yet. This is just a plan. So we wrote a plan for a meta-analysis. We said that we're going to search the entire literature and that we're going to uh, look, summarize at all the effects, both the pro-social effects, the norm adherence um, effects, and the personal effects of um, um, you know, associations with free, free will beliefs. And then we'll be able to kind of look at uh, which effects are stronger, which association is, is, is stronger. So that's something that I'm really looking forward to. So that we got the in principle acceptance from a journal. Uh, now all we need to do is actually do the work. So I'm really looking forward to Kevin and the rest of the team um, kind of uh, finishing up the, the search and the coding so we can provide these insights for everybody who's studying free will beliefs. But this is only to show you that uh, people care about this and we, we do work on this, uh, something very promising about uh, this fundamental notion of free will. It's not just hypothetical scenarios with experimental philosophy about uh, you know, the universe that might be, but there are some real implications for people in their, in their lives and some associations that we can uh, study both correlational and experimental. This meta-analysis is more on the correlational association type, but I already know of some others that look at the experimental part. Of, of free will beliefs. Now, I want you to uh, hear a little bit from Roy Baumeister about his perspective, about the link between uh, moral responsibility and whether it's a prerequisite to free will. Free will assumes personal agency. Free will and moral responsibility are intertwined in a kind of descriptive circularity. 
How to escape the circle? One way is to see that free will and moral responsibility do not exist in isolation. Interpersonal, social, and cultural factors play crucial roles. That's why I go back to Florida State University to meet social psychologist Roy Baumeister. Well, in very plain terms, the idea of free will is that the person could act differently. A moral judgment is essentially a judgment about should that person have acted differently. The same with a legal uh, judgment, that should the person have done something else rather than rob the liquor store. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, uh, the judgment that the person should act differently is based on the assumption that the person could act differently. Mm -hmm. so to my way of thinking, uh, in this, at least in this very simple sense of free will, that is essential to moral responsibility. Now, the argument goes the other way too. Why did we evolve free will? Why we developed that capacity? The ability to act morally is one of the crucial things that makes us human, that enables us to function well. One of the most basic norms is, is reciprocity. All other cultures do. If you do something to me, I should do it back to you. That's a kind of moral idea. But to control our behavior by it and actually pay someone back for, for something they've done for us, that requires a sense of moral responsibility, requires that higher mentality. It makes culture work, but it makes it possible. Sense of fairness is another thing that is uh, fairly universal in, in human cultures. So developing this better sense of moral responsibility was crucial for our developing of, uh, of culture uh, and goes with this new way of controlling our behaviors that you know, I think uh, goes by the name free will. So let's look at these two, um, two categories of ideas. Uh, the moral responsibility came about because we wanted to have a society for other reasons. We, we, we have to live in groups. Uh, free will has to do with the concept of self-control. So h how do these two articulate? Well, moral rules are mostly rules to restrain individual selfishness so you can do what's better for the group. So self-control very simply is the ability to change your behavior, to do this instead of that, to override in particular what you might feel like doing in order to do something else. So we call sometimes uh, self-control the moral muscle, but it's also the trait that enables you to resist selfish impulses and do what's morally right. So very, very interesting things here from uh, Roy Baumeister about the link between free will and moral responsibility. Now, the other person that I mentioned, Daniel Dennett, talks about uh, things from his uh, perspective as a philosopher. So two great minds, one from social psychology, the other from philosophy. Let's hear from Daniel Dennett. I recall how philosopher Daniel Dennett put it to me. People want to know about free will, they want to protect free will, and so they should. It's very important. If the world is undetermined, it's just as hard to see how you could have free will that mattered because you want to determine what you do. It's really interesting that we use this word determined, and mainly it's a, it's, it's a term of praise. We say, she's so determined, <laughs> and so we should. It's, we want to determine our actions, yeah, yeah. but we don't want us to be determined in the determining of our actions. Right, Dan, I do not want to be determined. I want to determine my own thoughts and actions. I want to be able to do otherwise than that which I do. But if I cannot do otherwise, then would free will be an illusion? Would there be consequences? I think that's right. I think we have to recognize that, sure, there are varieties of free will, the traditional varieties, which who cares whether we've got them. The varieties of free will worth wanting are co perfectly compatible with determinism. Now, do we have to give up something? Yeah, we have to give up something and good riddance to it about blame and responsibility. Yeah, we can give up blame and responsibility. So who said that we need these kinds of, of notions? How is this uh, helpful for us? in any way. Can we have a society where we don't blame and hold people accountable? Or perhaps we have a different notions? That, oh, oh. So uh, very interesting questions over here from, from Daniel, Daniel Dennett uh, raised. Now, um, I want to mention uh, one of our tutors did some stuff on, on free will. This is actually, if you ask Kit about his own extension and what he added to his own replication when he was taking my course, you can see he added 
uh, belief in free will. So it is something that we can look at as an association between uh, belief in free will agency and then perhaps something in judgment and decision making. It's not an extension that I promote. It's uh, uh, something that he decided to do on his own. And you can see that we submitted this to uh, a journal. Uh, we found some uh, really interesting uh, effects over here, especially when it comes to a specific type of free will beliefs and the, what's been called the bias blind spot that we talked about. Uh, I can't remember which week, but uh, a while back about us being blind to our own biases. So sometimes there's an association between our own beliefs and free will and the way that we make uh, judgment and decision making uh, evaluations. Uh, and there's some biases in there. So some very interesting research that came out from both the uh, fundamentals of social psychology and advanced social psychology with some really interesting uh, extensions um, that uh, uh, Kit, uh, one of our, our tutors, added to his own replications. So finally, the last few um, minutes, I want to discuss experimental philosophy. So we have heard a little bit, we saw some scenarios, you've played a little bit with the notion of the true self, the moral self, uh, and the universes in terms of free will. Uh, I want to, we don't have enough time to hear from Eddie, but we have enough time to hear from Joshua introduce a very interesting experiment in experimental philosophy to try and give you a taste of the possibilities of experimental philosophy. Hi, I'm Joshua Nobe from Yale University, and today I'm going to be talking about a new approach to philosophy that is sometimes called experimental philosophy. The basic idea behind experimental philosophy is that we might be able to make some philosophical progress by actually going out and running systematic experimental studies, much like the experiments people usually run in social psychology or in cognitive science. Now you might be thinking, how could running a study like that ever help us make any progress in philosophy? After all, philosophy isn't supposed to be about how people ordinarily think, it is supposed to be about figuring out which answers to these questions are actually the right ones. This is definitely exactly the right question to be asking, but experimental philosophers claim that by running these studies, we can get some valuable insight into why people have the thoughts they do. And if we understand why people typically have the thoughts they do, we might be able to get a better sense of whether we should be putting our trust in those thoughts or just dismissing them. There's a lot of controversy about whether this approach can ever actually work, but I thought it might be good just to give you a quick example so that you can make up your mind for yourself. The experimental philosopher, Felipe de Brigard, recently ran a series of experiments to investigate the way people ordinarily think about a famous philosophical thought experiment called the experience machine. His idea was that if we could get a better understanding of what is going on in our minds when we hear this thought experiment, we might be in a better position to figure out whether our thoughts about it are correct or incorrect. Now, the experience machine and thought experiment goes like this. Imagine that in the future, there are super duper neuroscientists and these neuroscientists are able to create a machine that can stimulate your brain in such a way that you think you're having a truly amazing life. So if you enter the machine, you will think you are accomplishing extraordinary things, that you're having deep and fulfilling relationships, and that everyone admires and respects you. But you won't really be doing anything at all. In real life, you'll just be a person lying in a vat of water somewhere, being stimulated to believe that all these amazing things are happening. Now comes the question, would you go into the machine? Most people say that they wouldn't. And philosophers sometimes start with this basic thought and use it as part of an argument for the conclusion that there is more to life than just experiencing happiness. That there is something important about being connected up in the right way to reality. But de Brigard thought that maybe there was more to this story. So he conducted an experiment in which participants were given a case we might call the reverse experience machine. The reverse experience machine case goes like this. Imagine you are going about your ordinary life when one day you get a visit from a mysterious man named Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith explains to you that this whole life you think you've been leading, with all your supposed friends, your accomplishments, even your mother and father, is simply an illusion. A number of years ago, you encountered some super duper neuroscientists and they offered to put you into an experience machine where you would be stimulated to believe that you had exactly this life you think you've been having. Now you face a question. If you'd like, you can leave the machine and go back to your real life. Or, if you'd prefer, you can stay inside the machine and the neuroscientists will erase any memory you have of the visit from Smith. So think about it for a moment. What would you do? 
When Desbrigard framed the thought experiment in this reversed way, he found that most people actually said they wanted to stay in the machine. So now it seems that we have learned something important about ourselves, and that we might want to reevaluate the conclusion we drew from the original version. When we were just thinking about that original version, we had a particular intuition, and that intuition led us, as part of a complex philosophical argument, to arrive at a certain conclusion about what was truly important in life. But now it seems that we've acquired some new knowledge about the psychological processes that made us have that intuition in the first place. We learned that these processes aren't just sensitive to the difference between reality and illusion. They also leave us with a strong tendency to stick with whatever sort of life we've already got. So, now that you've learned this new fact about how people think, would you still arrive at the same conclusion from the experience machine thought experiment? Do you want to stay in the matrix or do you want to uh, take the blue pill and uh, go back to reality? Uh, very interesting findings from, from Joshua Nob and Experimental Philosophy. If you want to read more about this, uh, it's published in this journal called Philosophical Psychology that's now um, common uh, among the experimental philosophers. You can see this reverse about the reversed uh, experience machine and whether people want to go back or not. So it's not uh, about you know, whether people want to uh, experience reality or whether they want to experience uh, happiness. It is about uh, something that has to do with the status quo. So people choose to remain in what it is that they were already in. Uh, a little bit like with the link with the bias uh, blind spot and the belief in, in free will. So there is some association between experimental philosophy judgment and decision making. And sometimes we can make the links between something very fundamental, very basic in philosophy to something that we can uh, study and look at in judgment and decision making in terms of heuristics uh, and biases. Over here, you can see that experimental philosophy since 2011 received more and more attention. So over here, Sean Nichols uh, published this in, in Science and, and it started a, a, whole, a whole group of people doing experimental philosophy. And recently, they've done their own replication project, which I really like. So this is estimating the um, replication of a lot of classics in experimental philosophy. You can see them dating until 2003, 2004, uh, up until this uh, very day. And you can see a very big team of experimental philosophers. Some of them we work with and, and we know quite well. Uh, among those names, you can see uh, Josh Nob um, and a few others that are, are collaborating with me on all sorts of, of projects uh, like Anthony over here. And what's interesting over here, uh, the you know, experimental, experimental philosophers refer to themselves as uh, X-Files or X-Fi. So um, you can see that they've done this uh, uh, 40 different X-Files studies published between 2003 and 2015 and uh, they got 20 different research teams from eight different countries to conduct this over here you can see the summary of the whole thing and what's really interesting is that they found a replication rate of about 70. 70 that's uh, uh, that's really that's really good 70 percent is a high high ratio of replication and surprisingly it's very similar to our own 70% replication rate in judgment and decision making. Uh, I guess it has to do something with uh, us also using vignettes, also doing kind of very simplified scenarios, uh, but also perhaps because it's a more recent movement and it implements some of uh, best practices in, in uh, what we have in cognitive sciences and, and some of the reliable stuff in judgment and decision making. And many of the people who are involved in experimental philosophy have some background in the cognitive sciences. So at the very least, it's very, very encouraging. What's even more encouraging and nice about this replication rate is that they've categorized this into different parts and they've looked at what is the difference between the different um, uh, studies. So the differences uh, have to do, for example, with the type of effect. So if we look at content-based, and then the replication rate is very, very high, around 90.3%. But if we look at the context based of the demographic effect, um, uh, they're perhaps lower. And this is in line with some of the stuff that we've seen from social psychology. I was talking to, to Josh about this, and this is kind of the, uh, the hypothesis that he had for uh, our replications in judgment and decision making. 
So I'm definitely gonna be looking into it uh, once we have a, a good sample uh, by the end of the year, hopefully complete a hundred of these replication projects. So uh, hopefully we can do something very similar to this very impressive group of experimental philosophers. Amazing project, very nice findings, terrific insights. I really like this, this kind of direction. We don't have a lot of time left. Uh, so I was going to ask you to participate in the side effect effect, or some people refer to this as the Josh Nob effect. Uh, but this has to do with a, a very simplified scenario about how people um, attribute intentionality uh, or harm, uh, how they evaluate harm in terms of uh, the blame that they, they give or how they evaluate uh, praise in terms of the help uh, that, that was given. So um, perhaps we'll do this a little bit later uh, and come back to this. Uh, but generally what you can see is that people uh, tend to attribute uh, blame to harm a lot more than they tend to attribute praise uh, when the environment was helped, when this was a side effect, when this was not uh, intentional. And this has to do something with, with intentionality. And we also kind of uh, replicated this, but we took the Josh Nob uh, effect, the side, side effect effect, and we linked it with the free will paradigm. So together with uh, uh, Prasad and Adrian over here, we did our own two different studies uh, combining uh, free will determinism and side effect effect. And we found some really interesting, interesting findings that are now written up and hopefully will be submitted soon. But everything is linked to morality, uh, issues of intentionality, issues of the mind, the self, who we are, what we're about, what is our existence, in what environment do we exist. Um, experimental philosophy, using methods from judgment and decision making, uh, methods from social psychology can really help us better understand the way that people view uh, all, all these basic fundamental abstract uh, notions and possibly give us some insights about their cognition and about their behavior. So if any of this is interesting for you, then social psychology, judgment, decision-making and experimental philosophy is waiting for your, your insights. Uh, lots of things to do. Right now, it's still a very small group, but experimental philosophy is growing. So if something that you want to uh, look into, uh, definitely you can come and talk to me about that. So that pretty much uh, sums up uh, this uh, week. Um, this is only to say that we have this uh, new exciting direction, which we can study all sorts of things about the self, about the mind, about our existence, um, free will, and the link to moral responsibility, and that philosophy uh, doesn't have to stay abstract. It has implications for real life, for both individual and the society. If you have any questions about uh, this direction, experimental philosophy, what we do in social psychology, the replications, uh, if you want to discuss uh, the peer review process that you need to do this week or any of the replication and extension projects uh, that you submitted that you're working on, perhaps your uh, reviews, opinion papers, whatever you want, uh, please reach out to me on Slack.